What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman, and joining me once again is the one and only Mike Wall, former Packers guard, former Packers great, and of course, our friend here on the podcast. Mike, how the heck are you doing? It is Packers Bears Week. Packers Bears Week, Andy. I'm excited for it. And uh, as always, thanks again for having me on. Yeah, I always appreciate it. We've had a ton of amazing feedback. People are absolutely loving it. So great to get to talk to you each week. I want to start off right there with Packers Bears. You were obviously a member of the Packers for a while. Um, I know, you know, when McCarthy came, he really started to re-emphasize that rivalry. I'm sure it's probably something that was emphasized during your time as well, but I wanted to pick your brain on that. How much was it emphasized when you were on the team? And then two, does it, as a player, did it really matter that much when it was a rivalry? Was it just another week? How did that kind of work? Well, I think as a player, I think mathematically, you just understand the importance of winning divisional games, winning conference games. So there's, there's that portion of it. For us at the time, because you got to remember, I got drafted the same year as Randy Moss. And so they, and then that, that Vikings team and the way that they were formulated, and then we came back and we drafted three cornerbacks in the first three rounds of the draft. Fred Vincent, obviously, Chi-Town Mike, and the first rounder, I can't remember his name. Antoine he, he Edwards, right? Yeah, he, he, was, he didn't pan out to be very much of anything, but... But but obviously, and then from Fred we get we get him on in, in the trade, and so that 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 series of of actions kind of made it that the Vikings were the team that we really looked at as division rivals. And then obviously, having some good Chicago Bears defensive players show up, whether it was guys along the defensive line, whether it was you know Tank, and then of course, um, oh gosh, ninety one Tommy Harris, uh, uh, Brian Urlacher. Um, Lance Briggs, all those guys being uh, being all pro caliber players. I think from our standpoint, we enjoyed playing that Chicago Bears, testing that defense, but it was never really our rival. Um, and that's really, you know, to be honest with you, rivalry is really more about the fans. And, and I think, you know, like even with some of the stuff that was said this week, you're probably looking at that as a player going, yeah, okay, so what? I think that's more of like the owner of the Bears is probably in the locker room, like rattling the saber, like we better beat these guys. You know, they, don't, they don't want to hear that nonsense. It's not necessarily for the players. Yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. It's kind of how I always viewed it, where it was probably a little bit more of a, a media contraption and, you know, Packers Bears, obviously there's a long-term rivalry, uh, but you guys are trying to win games. And, you know, you mentioned the importance of the division. I think that's something that's stressed throughout. Obviously, Matt LaFleur has mentioned it on numerous occasions as well, it, just mathematically, right? You face everyone in the division twice. You win your division, you get a home playoff game. And I think that's what maybe goes into it a little bit more than, all right, this is the 100 and whatever, 200, whatever time that these two teams have played. And um, yeah, I think it, it's a, a really fun thing as a fan it's a really fun thing to look at as you know the media breaks down the wins and losses and certainly the green bay packers success over the last three decades plus but uh yeah i'm sure as a player it's uh, sort of another sunday well I, I will say this the fact that you play them twice does carry weight if you have opponents against you that are like what you, what you would call like high caliber opponents right so individually back when the tampa was still in our in our division I'm looking at John Randall twice a year. I'm looking at Warren Sapp twice a year. I'm looking at uh, Luther Ellis twice a year. And then move along with Tommy. When Tommy showed up, Tommy Harris twice a year. These yeah. are all, all pro caliber players. So from my perspective, it's like I have, I know I have eight really, really hard weeks of work to put in in this, in this yeah. NFL season, right? So there's that part of it. But again, I don't know how much that turns into a rivalry thing like we always want to win our individual matchups. Our individual matchups turn into the team matchups that you know, pulls in the team's favor. You know, we, we execute scheme better than they do, so we win games. And it is funny to see how, and you mentioned a perfect example of it, but how teams within the division try to counter each other, right? So you get Randy Moss, so the Packers go out and draft Edwards and Vincent and McKenzie and so on and so forth. So you, you try to counter there. Same thing, right? You guys had Brett Favre, so every defense on the other side is trying to get these pass rushing defensive tackles and edge rushers that is going to make life as miserable as possible for Favre because they know if he has time to pass, it's going to be a long day at the office. So that makes your job a lot easier or a lot harder, excuse me, because you're going against all these teams who have tried to stack their defensive lines to stop Brett and company. Yeah, certainly you remember well, I'm sure that the rivalry between him and John, I think Warren Sapp really got on the map because of his rivalry between uh, rivalry with Brett. So those things feed into one another. Chris Hovan tried to jump on that bandwagon for a while as, as far as, you know, taking the place of John Randall when he retired. And they've always had, I think from this division, when I look back, 
I just think this division always had really, really good defensive tackles, but that's, you know, obviously have some bias there in, in regards to what position I played and what I had to deal with. But when I look back at the division, you know, we, you know, the old black and blue division, you really just take pride in the fact that we had a really good, especially back then we had a really good line. We had a really good ground game and success in the trenches versus some really good opponents. You mentioned all of those insanely talented defensive tackles. I'd be remiss not to ask you, who is the biggest pain in the ass to go? Oh, against. John Randall. Oh, yeah. John, John. Well, so John Randall was the combination of he was in his prime when I first got into the league and I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> right. But even now, it's like you, you always try to. You always try to think about now from a generational standpoint, what guys would just be incredibly successful still. And when you just especially Tommy. But John and, and Warren Sapp, I mean, I can't imagine what Warren Sapp would be doing to these, these guys nowadays. Just with that, one, again, that idea, like, I have one move, and I'm so good at that move, I'm just going to keep doing it. I guarantee I beat you five times a game. It's just a question of the quarterback. Is that good at that move? His footwork was that precise. John Randall. John Randall would beat you, and then he'd spin back into you, and then he'd beat you again, and he'd still have time to hit, hit the quarterback. That's how good he was. Yeah. Yeah, you know, he, he was. They actually used to call Brett used to make a joke, or I think maybe it was Frankie Winters used to make a joke when they went to Minnesota. This is kind of before I got there that they were they were always throwing hot off the three technique. Didn't really matter where he was. You were throwing hot off him. He was that good. Yeah, he's an incredible player. I remember that rivalry really well. It was always fun to watch. Of course, you know, didn't love seeing John Randall as a Packer fan. Uh, you know, come to town, but you certainly respected what he was able to do on the football field. I think that transitions perfectly because I wanted to talk about Kenny Clark because he's having, in my opinion, a phenomenal season. And he, to me, he's sort of like literally the center of the defense where everything else kind of revolves around him. When he is owning the center of the defense, it certainly makes the edge rushers jobs easier. It makes the linebackers jobs easier when he's getting penetration that makes it less time for the quarterback to throw, which makes things easier on the corners and safeties. To me, when Kenny Clark is at his best, this defense is at his best, and Kenny Clark's been at his best a lot of this season. How important has he been to this team, and what have you seen on film from Kenny so far this year? Kenny's the most viable player on defense, hands down. It all starts with that push in the defensive line. It's, it's, it's really been interesting this year, I think from a media and therefore a fan standpoint, because of new statistics, because we're kind of embracing the idea. I think one of the coaches said that pressure counts more than sacks because you have a chance yep. to get rid of the ball or give, give the ball away. And so we're seeing how important the push from defensive tackles is maybe comparative compared to like the, uh, the compression from the defensive ends, trying to run the corner from the defensive ends and how important that is to the makeup of, of how a, a team plays team defense and, and what those, those pressures can turn out to be later on in, in, in the, uh, the sequence of that play. Kenny has first and foremost, he has manhandled, whoever is trying to single block him all season. And if you can just say one thing about a guy, it's what side of the line of scrimmage is he playing on? Kenny Clark plays on their line, their side of the line of scrimmage almost every snap. You know, I, I can't like, I can't really even think of a play single block play where he's not playing on their line, their side of the line of scrimmage. Agreed. If you're able to do that and he's not getting, it's not like he's getting, he's not like Dom can who gets like, you know, four or five offsides penalties a game, right? Like, or at least he used to. He's doing it on the snap count. You know, he's he's winning with technique. He's winning with that size and that athleticism. He's become a real student of the game. And because he's getting these pressures now and it's it's like a stat, I think he's finally getting the respect that he deserves. He's improved this year from last year. Don't get me wrong. Like he's making steady improvement. But I think you can appreciate the damage that he's doing to offenses this year because there's like now a, a metric that we all can kind of embrace. Right. Does that make sense? It very much does. And yeah, Mike Smith certainly has been the, the Packers coach that has really been uh, pumping up pressures, which is certainly understandable. I love watching, you know, the all 22 and just seeing who's resetting the line of scrimmage. And it's just, it's Kenny Clark. It's Kenny Clark. It's Kenny Clark to the point where, yeah. And I actually love the plays too, where that go completely, I think unnoticed by the naked eye on a, on a given play where it's two offensive linemen trying to double Kenny and just get him off his spot. And he's just like, screw you. I'm not moving anywhere. You're not getting me out of here. And just everything that he's able to do run game, pass game. He's just a complete total player on the defensive side. And we're a million percent aligned in the fact that most valuable player on this side of the defense or on the defense, excuse me. 
Yeah, for sure. And, and you talk about the double teams. I think what's interesting looking across the the league and the way that different D line coaches are, te- are teaching how to attack a double team. Like if I'm a defensive lineman, if I play three technique, I know I'm going to take on a double team, whether it's a backside or play side double team. I kind of have options, right? You can see some teams are going to play right into it and they're just going to try to like kind of take both hands, one on each chest and kind of absorb both guys. Some guys are going to play to the backside tackle and just kind of attack the tackle. So the guard might be able to get off, but now I'm going to penetrate. Might attack the guard and watch the whole play down and make it so that that, that tackle rising to the second level is going to have a hard time getting on that linebacker. And what, Or you can just try to split it with your shoulder. And Kenny can do all of them. He can literally do all of them. And he does them all very, very well. And so you see these, you see the split, you see the penetration, you see, you see him driving on the tackle, you see him wash down. It's, and I don't know from a, from a, from a tactical standpoint, whether or not week to week, play to play, they're making some decisions on how they want to absorb that double team, but you can see him dominate in a, in a variety of ways, depending on the personnel that they bring in. And that's usually a sign. I mean, for me of a very astute player, not a dominant, not only a dominant player, but a, you know, a person that, what I would just call has a high football IQ. Yeah. There's certain players on the Packers. There's a lot of really high end players, but there's a level of nuance to the game that unless you're you know sort of watching closely, you may not pick up on. And, and Kenny Clark has a lot of the nuance that he plays with and just some, some really fun plays. He's one of those players that I can't stress enough. If ever anyone wants to just start watching, uh, you know, specific play, like just watch Kenny Clark uh, play after play and enjoy what the heck he's doing on the defensive side of the ball, because he impacts literally everything um, I wanted to ask you too, because you met, you made that great point about the edge rushers, you know, you used to be a huge priority. Now they're sort of looking at it as the, the quickest point for, you know, for, to the quarterback is from point A to point B, which is on the interior. And you're seeing much more value at the defensive tackle position because of that, because they can win on the inside, even seeing players like Zedaria Smith and past line up over center to get you to the quarterback potentially quicker it seemed like at one point, maybe at the time when you were playing, where there was almost this idea of, you know what, you could get by, get by with maybe a guard or two that weren't the best because we just really want to have great tackles and we want to maybe a good center. But it seemed like guards were maybe a little bit more of a throwaway at the time, not a throwaway is the wrong word, but you know, maybe a lesser value. Now we're all of a sudden starting to see players like Elijah Vera Tucker get drafted, I think in the top 15. I remember this past season, you're seeing guards get the $10 million figures and things like that. It seems like because now that so much emphasis is on those defensive tackles that the guards and the centers are maybe getting a little bit more respect that they probably already deserved, but maybe are getting it now a little bit. Do you see a little bit of a transition there? Well, I mean, I'm biased, obviously, but I, I always thought we were pretty important. I think we changed percent. the I think we changed the market completely, though. Honestly, was when Tom Coughlin decided to drop Justin Tuck into the three technique against the Patriots in the Super Bowl. Sure. That changed everything because Justin Tuck came down, and all of a sudden you had and Justin Tuck's. A, if you ever stand next to him, you're going to feel terrible about yourself. I, <laughs> I guarantee it. Six five, two ninety, dude's handsome. He's ripped. You're just like, oh man, this sucks. But <laughs> he went into that game. And he was the biggest factor in that game to me. As I watch, of course, I'm, I always watch the trenches. He's the biggest factor in that game because he just started ripping on those that left guard and that right guard for the New England Patriots, sacking Tom, getting in his face, pressure. They all of a sudden they had something new to worry about. And from that, you started seeing guys, defensive ends, all the way now to Zedarius coming in, and now they're rushing against the guards. What have we noticed too? We just talked about it's the the shortest the, the shortest distance is a straight line, like you said. And pressure is equal picks. And again, it has been baffling to me as an offensive lineman how the media, team, whatever, I don't know why we haven't figured this out before. Like, it was always very obvious to us. Like, if you get Tom Brady off his spot, what happens? He has a problem. Like, that's always been the thing, right? There's some guys, if you rush them up the middle, they can escape. There's some guys, if you rush them from the side, they can't. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of different nuances that are – kind of quarterback specific, but generally speaking, this has always been a priority, but because we didn't shine a light on it. And again, advanced statistics, whatever it is, just conversations in the media from different coaches. I don't think that it's been paid the attention that it should. Um, But having said that, you know, you've got some guys in the league now. I mean, the, the, the pay scale is going to go up regardless. Yeah. Uh, But I do, I do remember that. I think when I was playing, 
the discrepancy in pay was probably a couple million dollars between guards and tackles. And I, and I think it's probably still there, yeah. but it's just been elevated so much. I do, I do appreciate guys like Quentin Nelson coming in, being drafted in the top five, top six, and then everyone going, he might've been the steal of the draft. Cause he's, I mean, he's just that talented, right? He, he has that big of an impact on the game because Lyman really can, if, if you look at a really well-coached offensive line, the, impact that they can have on a game as far as dictating what you can do as an offense regardless of how much kind of if your quarterback's in the top 15 if your running back's in the top 30 the impact they can have on a game is absolutely substantial and substantial enough to invest some real time in not only procuring those athletes but developing them yeah i always look at offensive line as as like multipliers right like if you have a good quarterback a good running back a good wide receiver the packers are a great example right rogers jones Devontae adams all amazing players but if you have an amazing offensive line that gives Rodgers time and Aaron Jones running space, it multiplies their talents, right? It makes Adams better. It makes Rodgers better. It makes Aaron Jones better. It makes AJ Dillon better. If you have an, a terrible offensive line or a couple of weak spots here and there, now Rodgers has to get rid of the ball quicker. Maybe those, you know, those holes don't exist, which doesn't give Aaron Jones the ability to be the explosive playmaker. So to me, offensive line is just a multiplier that you solidify that. And it just makes Rodgers and Jones and Adams and everyone else on the offense better. Yeah, that's absolutely, that's a really good way to think about it. And, and, Really, if you, if you look at like the Chicago Bears right now have, except for Jason Peters, have a relatively young offensive line. A lot of guys that they drafted, they're homegrown. We talked about this last time they played. They are, you know, people, people are bashing them as you know, how bad they are. I've watched multiple film, uh, multiple games on them. They're not, they're not a bad line. Right. They're improving every week. They, they have pretty good footwork. They play with good pad level. They're, they're getting better at their double teams. It's, unfortunately maybe there's a play here or there where one player gets beat and they've kind of, you take credit as an entire offensive unit, or you have a quarterback who can't complete a, a, a three yard shallow cross on a third and three, and he throws it high and they might blame it on them instead of the fact that his feet aren't set. Like there's other things going into it, but you know, it is just so, so important to not only be able to find the right guys, which I think is the hardest part for a personnel group. It, it's one of those positions that it's really hard to measure kind of what's inside you. Cause I think that matters more than anything as an offensive lineman and then being able to take what that is and being able to mold it and develop it into the kind of player that you want for your franchise. Yeah. There's so much, so much nuance there. I'm going to love uh, if we have the opportunity to talk about some of the prospects once college time comes around and you know what they're doing in college and what their, you know, their uh, you know, that tenacity is and, and how that kind of goes into the evaluation process. We should be able to jump into that in the off season a little bit. Um, mentioning the bears. I always enjoyed Cody Whitehair's game. I think he's always been uh, really good with his technique and a fun player to watch as well, but it just goes the show like there's there's really talented players on every team and yeah some teams offensive lines are better or worse than maybe others but uh, a lot of talent and I think the Bears offensive line doesn't quite get the credit that they deserve I wanted to follow up on something that we talked about last week because you had mentioned that you know there were times where you know the offense and Amon Green would run the same play over and over and you could see maybe a defense just getting you know worn down in that regards well, we've now entered December and January football, Lambeau Field, cold weather, and Green Bay just so happens to have a running back in A.J. Dillon that seemingly could really wear a defense out and sort of take a defense's soul away. We saw last, you know, last game, excuse me, against the Rams where he's running over Taylor Rapp and, and you know, just kind of uh, having that sort of impact. Not a lot of holes in that game, but he was running hard, running physical. Just what can he bring to this offense in this time period and how deflating can that be for a defense if he can really establish himself and really get going? I think that just the physical physicality that he brings because of his size alone, even if he just ran straight up and down, which he's gotten so much better at running behind his pads, he just brings a physicality that when it gets into this cold weather, when the ground's hard, when you're standing near that that space heater the entire time you're in the you're you're on the sidelines because your 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 hands are cold your body's cold, it really does great on a defense. And you know, as as an offensive lineman, as somebody who loves running the ball, and as a, as somebody who got to play in cold weather, there's really no better feeling in the world than when you look across the sideline and you see the entire defense standing in front of that space heater trying to stay warm because you know they really don't want to be there anymore. And I think what a guy like Dylan does is he just gets him over there a couple minutes earlier, sure. right? He just makes them start focusing on, oh man, remember I got to go low on this guy, but his thighs are so big. I don't want to get knocked out. Like there's just, when you have to tackle a guy like that, there's some business decisions that you have to make because 
he can, you can do everything right. And he can still split your shoulder because he's that big. And I think when, and I don't even, I don't think that he has grasped how powerful he is and how explosive he can be into these, some of these, you saw that with what happened with, with, with rap uh, two weeks ago, but I think he's got a lot more in the tank as far as in a couple of years from now, where he's going to be, how he's going to position himself, but having a 250 pound guy that can be your workhorse, not only is just a compliment to what Jones has done here for so many years, but as a, as a workhorse back in, in December and January, I, it is a, uh, it's like you said, it's a multiplier of what your offense can be because it's really going to be demoralizing when you know you can fall forward for three yards every time he touches the ball. Yeah, not only do they complement each other well, but you know, we see around the league, you know, the Zeke Elliott's, the Christian McCaffrey's, the, you know, uh, Todd Gurley's where they're the primary back and they're getting, you know, 20, 30 carries, you know, in that realm per game early in their career. And as you get to that second contract time frame they, you know, they, their bodies just start going on them. Right. And, you know, it's not always, there's certainly exceptions to that rule from time to time, but the fact that green Bay has been really able to keep, you know, Aaron Jones fresh through the majority of his career, never having to give him that 25 to 30 carry workload or 25 to 30 touch workload even. And now AJ Dillon, same thing. Like he comes from Boston college where he is that guy, right? He is getting 25, 30 touches against eight, nine man boxes because they were focused on stopping AJ Dillon. Then he basically gets his first rookie year where it's almost like a red shirt season. He, he, you know, I don't, I think he was maybe around like hundred snaps total on the season. And then year two, he gets to really split those carries that's going to have dividends as certainly get into later in the season where Jones and Dylan are still fresh. Uh, but also as their careers continue to go along to the point where Jones is in his second contract and he doesn't look like those other running backs who are starting to, to really break down. So uh, I, I think it really is a benefit to not only the Packers, but both of those backs that you have two guys that you can count on. You don't have to give any of them 30, 35 touches in the game. Yeah. It's funny. If, you know, if you asked AG, he would say, nah, we don't need another back. You got me. Of course. Right. And so it's, it's, it's always a perspective of running back. I think over the long term, those guys see the value of it. I do think it's interesting when you talk about Dylan specifically and just the size that he brings. You know, the, the NFL really swings the pendulum back and forth as far as what the expectations are for, for trench players. And this probably happens at wide receiver cornerback as far as the size of the corners changes with the size right. of wide receivers. But really, when you look at defensive linemen, when you look at what linebackers and what linebackers are, linebackers are expected to do now, like for me, the most intuitive thing to do now, given the size of linebackers being generally under 250 pounds, 245 pounds, we're, we're usually talking about linebackers, 230, 235, maybe, maybe high 230s. When I see that, I think of Nick Barnett coming in back in the day and, and going like literally walking over to Mike Sherman, like flying again, Marco and I are like, Dude, what position does he play? Are you guys serious? Now, Nick turned out to be a great player and had a great career, and he was a fighter, man. I love that kid. But that's hard to play against a good downhill team at 230 pounds, 235 pounds. So for me, the obvious thing is kind of what you're starting to see with some of these teams. Bring a fullback back onto the team. Start running between the tackles a little more, like New England Patriots saw what they just did, did to yep. the Bills, right? Teams can't really handle that kind of physical play, not because they're not tough. They're literally just not built for it. They're not physically capable of handing that downhill, that downhill style. So you're going into a game now knowing that you have dimensions to your offense that other teams really don't know how to handle. And, and you have arguably the best quarterback in the history of quarterbacks. So we have a lot of opportunities to be successful on offense now with the Green Bay Packers. A.J. Dillon is, like you said before, I think, the word the best is describes him as a multiplier of this offense. Yeah, he's certainly a fun player. And I think that's, I, I just love the cyclical nature of the NFL and what's in vogue now is not going to be able to be in vogue because everyone counters each other, right? So right now we're seeing all these passing offenses of the last few, you know, few years with the Mahomes and the Rodgers and the Bradys and so on and so forth, these explosive offenses. So teams go lighter on the edges, lighter at linebackers so they can cover everyone. They're going two high safeties. And what you're seeing this year is the teams that can't run the football are struggling because teams are just taking away the pass. They're lighter up front. They're lighter at the linebacker. Their safeties are deep. You can't get those explosive plays. And the teams that don't have the counter to it, like we saw it at times with the Chiefs this season, have struggled to sort of overcome that. Um, and it's just like you said, it's going to get all of a sudden to the point where the teams are playing so much too deep and so light at linebacker and defensive line that there are going to be teams that just power run and have success. And then teams are going to have to bulk up because of that. And then teams will go wide. Like it's just going to go back and forth. And I, that's, I literally love that aspect of football, maybe more than anything that there's no like one secret formula because it just goes back and forth. 
Yeah, I mean, for me, the 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 secret formula is you better have got you better be able to develop talent. You better be able to teach kids technique. Sure. Um, I always look at it this way: if like if Watson was calling plays against Watson Jr offense defense like you, you would essentially be calling the perfect game after a number of iterations right yep. like every call would be a great call and what would it actually come down to then right what it comes down to now can players execute and win their one one v one matchups we talk we talk so much about scheme and personnel and everything like what it really comes down to at the end of this is when you watch good teams good teams win their, their individual matchups Good teams are well coached. They acquire good players. They develop their talent. They learn how to win. And then they have those special players, the Lamar Jacksons, the Aaron Rodgers, who when it is time to go off script, they go off script better than everybody else and get you those three, four plays a game that make a difference in the game. Yeah, the classic X's and O's versus Jimmy's and Joe's. And ultimately, when everyone's X's and O's are good, it comes down to the Jimmy's and Joe's. And I think that's what you see certainly come playoff time, uh, to say the least. I wanted to quickly ask you, I asked uh, Rachel Hotmeyer this early in the week and we had a great discussion. I posted it on Twitter as well. Um, you know, legacy is always a fun thing to discuss, but who, if Green Bay would in fact go ahead and make a run and win a Super Bowl, whose legacy in Green Bay has the most to gain? I think Aaron Rodgers, Matt LaFleur, you know, Brian Gutekunst, there's some, some obvious names there, but who do, you, who do you see as the most to gain from potentially winning a Super Bowl this season? Outside of their own households, right? Yes. Aaron Rodgers, without a doubt. Aaron Rodgers, I don't think there's, I don't even think there's a, a 1A or a, or a, a number two. Um, Matt LaFleur is, is, has done a, an exceptional job as a coach. Um, I think that it's fair to say that in the eyes of, of you know, everyone outside of his household and a handful of people in Green Bay, um, Aaron Rodgers is the reason that he has the record that he does. Goody, Goody has, 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 it's shown now that Goody has done a great job of acquiring some talent in different rounds, despite all of the, you know, acrimonious back and forth that we had during the off season and maybe the last couple off seasons. Um, some things have panned out, some things haven't, but again, when you, when you just look at you arguably, you know, from, from my money, Aaron's the best quarterback I've ever seen, like period. And, and, he just does so many things so well and his processing speed is so much higher than everybody else's that he is, he, I mean, he just showed you how important the chiefs game. And then he comes, I mean, you just, you see the Arizona game, you just go, there's no, there's very, very few people in history of football that can come and win those games or, or that responsible for that many points. So if Aaron can secure this, I think in the other thing in the eyes of, of, of America that look in on the Packers, the knock on Mike McCarthy was what, that how did you have Aaron Rodgers for that many years and not get to that many super, you know, more Super Bowls. So Aaron's sitting with that burden, I think. And, and kind of the expectation is, okay, man, like you, he's not here anymore. Let's, let's show. And, and I, I think he has to show. So that's the, uh, that, that would be my short answer. No, I think that that was Rachel's answer as well. I think that's the, the smart answer there as well. All right. Before we uh, finish up, I have to ask you, you know, I've had a couple of listeners reach out and want to know more about process to perform. And I'd be uh, remiss not to ask you a little bit more uh, about what you're doing on kind of a day-to-day -day basis and what process to perform is all about. Yeah. So thanks. The, the, there's actually, there's two things. So I do a player development podcast that I call process to perform. And so if you're a parent, player, or coach interested in all things, player development, we talk about, I mean, our three, our three themes are really uh, mindset development, technical mastery, and, and ownership decisions, which are just lifestyle choices in the best interest, interest of future you. And uh, I do a weekly podcast, usually out on Wednesday mornings. It's called Process to Perform. You can find that anywhere. Uh, we're actually having a great guest. We're having uh, Bethany Maddox-Sands, which is an Olympic uh, doubles tennis champion. Nice. Been on the tour for 15 years, I think now. Um, having her on and, and talking about mindset and, and kind of her development, and because tennis is such a unique sport, I think. Uh, as opposed to you talk about like the man in the arena. Uh, I don't think there's a sport maybe a set from uh, aside from mixed martial arts and boxing that you, you feel that alone in a situation as you do in tennis. You know, you, you think about your coaches in the stands, like you can't even be down there. Um, and then process to perform is also a platform I use to, to launch my, my total athlete development platform, which is really a, a way for me to help athletes who are committed to the cause athletes that are really, you know, competitive, aspiring athletes from pros all the way down to preteens, we help them become elite. And again, we're really focusing on those three themes, mindset development, technical mastery, and, and ownership decisions. And we do that through a four-month uh, program. My whole thing is I want to help athletes take ownership of their careers, teach them the tools, give them the tool set to be successful and to build those routines, develop those habits so that they can use them for the rest of their lives. Not only 
in sports, but also outside of sports in the, in, in the rest of their, in, in the rest of the, their, their doings and their, their uh, daily activities. And, um, uh, it's been really, really gratifying. I've been able to work with guys in the NFL all the way down to 12 year olds. We work multiple sports and uh, yeah, if anybody has any questions about that, hit me up again on, on, on Twitter, Mike Wall 68 Instagram process to perform. Then of course you can go to our website process to perform.com. Awesome. You're doing amazing work. Uh, might have to have, uh, hopefully my, maybe my son Xavier in about four years, depending on how he keeps uh, going with soccer here. Maybe we can uh, have him. Uh, I got a, soccer's I have two soccer kids. It's kind of my thing. Um, I, I've had a lot of soccer athletes and, and it's, that's well, you could spend a whole podcast on that sport, man. That sport is absolutely wild. Can even compared to football, just the, the idea of a, a fluid sport versus a sport where you just have to go, as hard as you can for six seconds and then hit reset. Right. So it's like football is basically 72 free throws, right. In a row. If you think about like, you can have a way to set yourself up and you know where the pockets of time are to get yourself right. Soccer, man, you got to find your own pockets and you got all this other stuff going on. There's 21 other players on the field that are moving dynamically. It's, it's, it's a, uh, it's a bear, man. It is an absolute bear. Yeah. Most people don't know. I actually uh, coached high school soccer and coached high school for or I coached uh, soccer for a long period of time. It was actually almost more of my uh, first passion than, uh, than football was. So love the sport. Uh, Xavier's crushing it in it. And it's a lot of fun to watch him right now, but yeah, Mike, amazing stuff as always, always great talking to you. You're doing great work with process to perform. Enjoy this uh, immensely every single week. And as I mentioned, I know our listeners and viewers have uh, really enjoyed it as well. So we will talk to you next week. Prediction for the Bears game? I think it's going to be painful. I think it's going to be painful for the Bears. I think I think this is uh, – I just – I watched the last – the Arizona game, and I understand the conditions and everything, but you have a lot of people on the defensive side of the Bears football that don't look like they really know what's going on when, as far as like – understanding reads, processing their scheme, awareness on the field. And, you know, I think we might be – I'm hoping that the, the Packers are poised for a big one coming off a of bye week. would certainly be nice. I, I look at it. They were uh, – the Bears were three and two the last time the Packers and Bears played. The game was in Chicago. Chicago was certainly still competing at that point. Packers beat them by double digits in Chicago. Green Bay's gotten better since that point. Chicago's gotten worse uh, and now it's in Lambeau following a bye week. I just don't see anything that's more advantageous to Chicago this time than it was last time. And uh, again, Green Bay won by double digits that game. So uh, that's why they play the games. Who knows? Things can get crazy, but I, I like Green Bay as well. Hey, like amazing you, stuff. Oh. Quick, quick question. What do you, I, cause I'm just, I just, I like to get the pulse of everybody. Matt Nagy was brought in as an offensive genius, right? Joe, Joe Brady was just, was brought in as an offensive genius to, to Carolina. We have a lot of offensive, young offensive genius play callers, scheme designers. What do you think, like, what does that term mean to you, I guess? Because I, from my perspective, it's always, I, I, I'll tell you my perspective later, but what, what does that term mean to you? Because we've got a lot of them coming in that are completely unsuccessful. Yeah. So here's, here's what I think is funny about this. Right. And we, we probably don't have a, a, an insane amount of time to dig into this, but so you had Matt Nagy as a genius, right? Where did he come from? Kansas city. Who did he have as quarterback? Patrick Mahomes, right. For like, for like, so he, like that helps, you know, are, are you like, was the offense great because of the design or was it great because you had Patrick Mahomes, right? Like, and then Joe Brady, right. He was a genius, right? I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe he was LSU, right? LSU offensive coordinator. Joe Burrow, yeah. Yeah, with well, Joe Burrow, right? Yeah, yeah, Joe Burrow in college, yeah. You're probably going to look like a genius a lot of times when you have Joe Burrow as your starting quarterback in college. Like these, if you look at the term genius, more often than not, they're coming from a successful offensive program that a lot of times had the best of the best of the best. And what I equate it to in a way of like when Matt Castle got signed as a, a quarterback, right? He got signed off of his season with the New England Patriots when he filled in for Brady in, in Brady's last year. I looked at that at Matt Castle and said, wh when I looked at that Patriots team, they were coming off their, what, 18 and one season losing this. Matt Castle had the most ideal conditions in the history of like he was playing with arguably the on one of the greatest football teams of all time. And ultimately, I know they were like a 10 and six team or 11 and five team that somehow didn't get in the playoffs, but he could not lead that team to the playoffs. Like if you're going to sign Matt Castle to a huge deal, 
Um, and he couldn't get that team to the play. What the heck is he going to do with your team? And he had to ultimately had a, a, you know, a nice career, or whatever. I'm not trying to dog Matt Castle here, but like, if he can't get that team to the playoffs, you, you, no other team is going to have a chance with Matt Castle getting into the playoffs. I look at the same thing as coordinators sometimes of like, yeah, I, I, the reason they were quote unquote geniuses is because they had all of this talented around them. I almost like some of the teams in the coordinators more who maybe didn't accomplish a ton, but did a lot more with less than they were expected to. Those are the geniuses to me, not the guys that have Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady and Joe Burrow and LSU and so on and so forth. So that's, that's my quick and easy take on it. I, I couldn't agree more. I, was, I, I always find it interesting. Like the, the, the smartest people in the room to me are the people that can adapt to their personnel. Just the easiest way to say it. If you've, if you've got a scheme that only works with certain people, or if you've been proven because, you know, it's like I was with Adam Gase and Adam Gase is an extremely smart individual, but I, I think it's fair to say his head coaching experience, he wasn't necessarily the quarterback developer that a lot of people thought he was going to be coming in for whatever reason. He is famous because he had that, that Super Bowl uh, uh, Denver Broncos record-breaking offense. Well, as I recall, Peyton Manning had a lot to do with that. And I believe Peyton Manning had his own staff of people that would break down film to get his tendency. So it's like, there's a lot of, there's just a lot that goes into it. Um, genius to me, Josh McDaniels running the ball 46 times with three passes. Like, honestly, that game plan, that stat, that's genius to me because they, they said, okay, what's the one thing these people can't do? And we have the discipline to do over and over, right? That's smart using your personnel, using the environment, the situations. So yeah, interesting. I, I just think that's an interesting take, man, because you just see so many owners fall in love with, uh, you know, trying to find the next Sean McVay, trying to whatever, whatever it is. Yeah. The, um, I, I couldn't agree more. I think you have to look at that, but the, the number one thing, if I was an owner uh, or a GM, like hiring a head coach, the number one thing I would like ask, like very first thing is I would want to hear, do they have a plan that can adapt to the players that they have on the roster and be able to, like, if we need to run a three, four, we can run a three, four or four, three. I know that's not mostly doesn't matter anymore, but like we can adapt to the players that we have on the team. If they say, this is my system and it's cut and dry and the players have to fit to my, like it's, it's over. Like you're not going to be the guy for the job for me. And I'm not saying some of that stuff can't work. I'm not saying that coaches haven't been like, but I want a guy that can come in and as the coach be adaptable to the, to what the players need, not that the players have to adapt to you. I think the coaches that can, and more often than not be successful with what they are given are going to be the ones that have more ability to succeed in a variety of more ways. Well All said. Right. Awesome, man. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. As always, we'll talk in a week. Enjoy Bears Packers and the rest of the slate of games this week. For those of you who are following, make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. We'll be right back here tomorrow with an all new episode, but until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.